navneet singh ji dear trainees welcome uh, this is as per the request you had given me last month that you need to understand what are the concepts of high talk high back high pack and high pack uh, i know that it's a mixture of a second and final year uh, so we are going to cover the general concept of high pack high talk which is done in thorax high back done in the bladder with hyperthermia and pipe back pressurized intraperitoneal chemo who better than uh, dr rohit consultant surgical oncologist at manipal comprehensive cancer center uh, extremely good surgeon very well read publishes maximum of my paper who analyze everything so very good in uh, statistics analysis core studies and prospective studies and multiple publications he has vast amount of publication in this particular field and he has also made a beautiful uh, video and a talk which was which he presented in natcon ias or delhi uh, where what are the preparatory steps and checklist you must do for high pack you can all uh, watch that it must be there on the ias website so i requested him to cover this particular topic one hour is too short to cover all this topic because each topic in itself is about 3 3 hours talk but he will cover it in a concept which is relevant to the students so please utilize this opportunity very well he will also cover the evidence for each general principle concept where you use how you use at the end of his talk utilize a good q and a and chat box to clarify all your doubts so it may be difficult to repeat this talk for next one year thank you very much rohit and over to you uh good morning uh, we are very uh, uh, you matlab uh, it's very a uh, good opportunity for all of us uh, to know about uh, the ad, uh, recent advances that's happening in management of peritoneal surface malignancies uh, so i believe uh, that this uh, principle of uh, knowing your why so if you know why we are doing uh, for any purpose for is it be it our life or our job we will know how and what to do it so why are we studying about pipec hypec and hyvec what is the principle behind it if we know if the principles then it is easy to understand the concepts regarding the background of those things so what we will be discussing today is about peritoneum which is very much important to understand the anatomy and physiology and the peritoneal metastasis pathway following that i'll be discussing pipec technology basics and indications hyvec technology and indications crs and hypec basics of it which is pci peritoneal carcinoma index index site reduction completion score and also indications in crs and hypec uh, for uh, all the diseases very importantly gastric cancer colorectal cancer ovarian cancer pseudomyxoma and mesothelioma and finally i have few slides with which we'll have a take home message to understand the important things uh, it's a very vast subject as sir told so i will try to see how much justice we can make with this so peritoneum embryology uh human tumor develops from three cotyledons we all know these things so embryology of peritoneum peritoneum develops from mesoderm in that lateral plate and uh, ovary also develops from the intermedial uh, uh, this thing of the uh, this thing uh, uh, so and gastrointestinal comes from the endoderm so if there is any peritoneal carcinomatosis where we have to know the origin if it is a ovarian origin or a gastrointestinal origin the markers from the endoderm or the markers from mesoderm is used to know what is the primary origin from this so then we understand the anatomy and physiology peritoneum morphology of peritoneum so peritoneum as such is a sac a layer which encompasses the abdomen it is having a thin layer of mesothelial cells which is based on basement membrane and then it is supported by sub mesothelial connective tissue the mesothelial cells have got lot of microvilli projected on them because of which they give a vast surface which is nearly equal to more than a tennis court and this is supported by basement membrane and also sub mesothelial stroma the sub uh, the meso microvilli on the microvilli you have surfactant phospholipids they form a glycocalyx layer this is the layer where we have uh, additions of tumor cells or masses of tumor cells peritoneal cavity is between parietal peritoneum and visceral peritoneum parietal peritoneum is something that covers the abdominal wall visceral peritoneum covers all the viscera so any ca the cavity in between these two is the peritoneal cavity so the major uh, it's around 2 meter square as i told the parietal peritoneum accounts for around 30% visceral peritoneum accounts for around 70% out of which nearly 35 to 40% is from the mesentery and the 
peritoneum covering the small bowel. The six major functions of peritoneum are fluid and solute transport, protection that is to protect against infections like peritonitis uh, for coagulation and clotting, immune responses and regulation, adipose tissue development is still acquiry, and then inflammation healing. Now we look into metastatic spread into the peritoneum. So we all know the peritoneal, the circulation of peritoneal fluid is from the lower abdomen, from the pelvis up towards the paracolic gutters. Along the paracolic gutters, the diaphragm movements happens along diaphragm and then along this it travels down. That is why we see most of the deposits occurring in the hidden areas, which is the subphrenic region, the lesser sac, mesentery, diaphragm and paracolic gutters. So this is uh, the picture in such big whenever there is a tumor which detaches and the cycle of peritoneal metastasis. So either cells, tumor cells or masses of tumor cells, when they are dislodged from the primary tumor, here we consider it to be a colon here, they come and attach to the glycocalyx layer here. From the glycocalyx, there is interaction between these two by integrins, e cadherins all those things, then there is penetration into the submesothelial stroma by the action of metalloproteinases. Then there is epithelial mesenchymal transition, which gives the ability to grow into peritoneal metastasis. So it involves a multi-step process in the peritoneal dissemination. There is detachment from the serosa of the cells, which is mainly because of loss of E-cadherin and N-cadherin. Then we have attachment of cancer cells on the mesothelial cells and crosstalk. Then we have contraction of the mesothelial cells, which occurs by exposure of submesothelial basement membrane, which happens by the interaction of the tumor cells with the mesenchymal cells. Then we have addition to basement membrane. Following the addition to basement membrane, we have invasion of cancer cells into subepithelial mesothelial lymphatic tissue. Finally, proliferation and neoangiogenesis, which is the hallmarks of cancer. So the multi-step process in peritoneal dissemination also includes translymphatic metastatic spread also, which is mainly mediated by the lymphatic stomata that is present on the diaphragm and also along the peritoneum. So there are also milky spots, which are very much important, which are mainly present along the uh, greater momentum and also diaphragm, which allows for the lymphatic spread. So there's a concept about multifocality and polyclonality in peritoneum. According to the monoclonal theory of carcinogenesis, cells within a tumor are derived from a single transformed cell. So mucinous tumors involving the appendix and ovaries in women with pseudomyxoma peritone are monoclonal and they are derived from the appendix. What is the uh, uh, this thing, uh, the implication of this? To do a partial or selective parietal peritonectomy. Then when there is a polyclonal involvement, as in serous ovarian tumor of low malignant potential or papillary serous carcinoma of the peritoneum, there is polyclonal origin of the cells because of which we have to do a total parietal peritonectomy. So modalities of dissemination, cancer cell, peritoneum, lymph node, distant metastasis. This is how the diseases in which the cancer is spread by into peritoneum. So final consideration very important in these slides is that a better understanding of the underlying tumor kinetics and mechanism of peritoneal dissemination, it will help us in selecting the best candidates to CRS HIPEC to modulate the surgical extension. Should we do a complete peritonectomy or a total a selective peritoneal peritonectomy? What are the indications of perioperative systemic therapies? So understanding of molecular events in peritoneal carcinomatosis helps us identifying the novel strategies to prevent the condition to identify surrogate markers and development of future molecular targets. So when we talk about peritoneal surface malignancy, it is about advanced diseases. So the secret to care of the patient is in caring of the patient. So now we'll start to discuss about PIPAC, which is pressurized intraperitoneal aerosol chemotherapy. PIPAC is a new method of applying intraperitoneal chemotherapy as an aerosol. It is not an experimental therapy. It is not offered as an experimental therapy, neither on compassionate use program. I am happy. Uh, I should thank uh, Dr. Hubner, Martin Hubner, and Dr. Somshaker, uh, who have allowed us to use few slides from the International Society of Pleuron Peritoneum 
to educate the young BNB students regarding PIPAC with these slides. So PIPAC is a drug delivery system. It is a considered as a drug device combination. We have drug and we have device. The target effect on the tissue is determined by the drug, not the device. However, to optimize the target effect of the drug, the entire system has to be optimized. So what does the system includes? Pipac optimization includes we have a high pressure injector. We need drug formulation, drug and the formulation, which forms into a solution, which is then passes through an aerosolizer, which forms aerosols and then affects the target tissue. So this is an inverted bovine urinary bladder model in which the initial studies of PIPAC was done. This is the setup if initially animal models was developed. So how do you optimize in the aerosol? So important to know what is aerosol. Aerosol is suspension of fine solid particles or liquid droplets in a gas. Here we use carbon dioxide gas. So aerosol is defined by the size distribution of the droplets. Most medical aerosols have a droplet size between 5 to 30 micrometer. The main mechanism by which they settle down is by sedimentation, which happens by gravitation with time and also by impaction that is flow dependent. So aerolyzer, this is the internal structure of the aerosol that is aerosolizer that is being used. So there is a lot of uh, structural details which needs more time to explain, which I will not be going through in detail. So this is a simple model where you can see considering the lateral wall of the abdomen, superficial of the, uh, the, uh, the roof, the floor, and also you can see that uh, our small tube in which the uh, disease tumor cells are placed. So with this, when the uh, uh, PIPAC is used, you can see the deposition, the concentration of tissue on this is equally distributed along the lateral wall and also on the roof. But there is a concentration gradient from the direct tissue where it is spread towards away from it. This is what you can see in this picture. However, in recent next generation aerosolizer, which is going to come in few more uh, months, in that the distribution is going to be more or less equal all throughout the abdomen. Now we have high pressure injector. So the, what is the role of angio injector? Injector is the same that is being used in our uh, CT scan or during IV contrast injection. So you can see here, minimum pressure that is required for in the area injector where you see maximum spread or maximum flow is between 13 to 20 pascals. So that is ideally between 180 PSI pressure to up to maximum of 300. So as recommended by the manufacturer of Capnomed, who is the uh, main sponsor or main manufacturer of the Capno pen, pen, they mentioned that minimum pressure of 150 has to be used and should not cross more than 300. The pressure is also determined by the flow rate. So normally the typical flow rate is always kept between 0.5 to 0.7 ml per second. Now the drug, we know this, uh, the IP drugs, we don't have any drugs that has been approved for IP, only acetylcysteine and bromelain is approved. All the other drugs are off-label used. The taxanes, mitomycin C, off-label use for oxaliplatin, cisplatin and doxorubicin also. So the drug concentration that is used right now, it has initially started off oxaliplatin with 92 milligram per meter square, and now it has come to a 120 milligram per meter square. This is the drug dosage which is we are using right now for oxaliplatin. For cisplatin and doxorubicin, we started off with 10.5 uh, and 2.1 milligram per meter square. Right now, this is the main uh, drug uh, level that is being used. However, there is a single trial which mentions the use of 3 milligram of doxorubicin, also 50 milligram of cisplatin, which we are uh, happy that uh, we are going to uh, present that in the ASCO, that is tomorrow. So this is the setup of PIPAC. This is the intra-abdomen where a pressure is created by laparoscopy. This is a 12 mm port and a 5 mm port is needed. 5 mm port to insert the camera and to check all those things. I'll explain the video. This is the capno pen which is required to spray the drug and the injector in which the uh, and drug is placed and injected out. It is always controlled by a remote control. So in PIPAC, we have three layer of safety. This is the internal layer abdomen. Second is have a directed unidirectional flow, and then everybody will be outside the operation room. So it is done by a remote application. 
So important steps in pipette procedure are we have to prepare and install, access the abdomen, staging laparoscopy, safety checklist, remote chemotherapy application, evacuation of the capnoperitoneum, and closing the abdomen and finishing the procedure. This is preparation of the patient. Then we have to access the abdomen, which is very important because many of the patients would have undergone many surgeries before. After accessing the abdomen, very important is to use uh, PAMA techniques, which is the most safest to use. Important to use balloon trocars, which prevents abdominal wall port site metastasis and also ensures the air tightness and prevention of aerosol spill. Once we are inside, we will talk about peritoneal cancer index. The staging laparoscopy is done. There is no usually routine hydrostasis is not done. Only minimal hydrostasis is done. However, recently there was an article present by, presented by the ISSP group, which talk about a uh, HIPEC plus in which they have mentioned that few minor procedures can be done within the pipette procedure also with no accept, uh, increase in morbidity or mortality. Once we enter inside all the offer documentation, multiple uh, biopsies are taken. We usually at least take biopsies from four sites. Local peritonectomy is usually not done. After that, what is important is a 4i principle that is followed even in daycare rooms in the medical uh, oncology. That is at least four two people should check the drug that is being used. After that, uh, the setup is completed, but are we ready to go? No, we have to always have a cross check cross. That is checklist. Checklist is always very important. In this checklist, we go through before starting the procedure. What are the techniques that is important and then follow that with before application of pipe what all is to be done, then uninstalling and ending the procedure. This checklist has to be used for every procedure whenever pipe is done. Then comes remote control where the nebulization is done. So checking the pressure during the aerosolization. Application of chemotherapy. <clears throat> After uh, aerosol is done, then for 30 minutes, we leave the aerosols to settle down in the abdomen to make sure that the drug is utilized in the abdomen. Following that, the entire material is evacuated into a cost system to prevent the uh, spill of the chemotherapy drug. So whenever we go inside, the biopsies, whatever is taken, the response of the pipac is graded by PRGS score, that is peritoneal regression grading score. This is graded from PRGS 1 to 4, with 1 meaning that there is absolutely good response and there is no tumor cells present. 2, 3 and 4 subsequently, this has correlated to show with increased overall survival and better benefit in patients. With the at least by second and by second cycle, if the PRGS score is still remaining at three and four, then the patient will usually not benefit much from PIPEC. So what do we know about PIPEC till now is that the clinical evidences that most of them are level 2B evidences. They show that PIPEC is safe, it is feasible and it is well tolerated. The preliminary oncological results are encouraging. There is very good response that has been documented on resist also by PRGS and the importance is there is improvement in quality of life and decrease in symptoms. So what we do not know about PIPEC is everything else because we don't have no randomized trials are published in PIPEC till now. However, many randomized trials are already under through. So places for PIPAC use, it is difficult to define indications for PIPAC without a comparative studies. PIPAC should be performed within the framework of clinical studies when competing with an evidence-based therapy. However, off-label use of PIPAC is legitimate since in peritoneal surface malignancy, it's a life-threatening disease. We don't have any drug or any modality of treatment available to treat the patients, and it can induce regression of peritoneal metastasis in salvage situation. So what are the general contraindications to do PIPAC? Absolute contraindication is short life expectancy of less than three months. If there is bowel obstruction and there is decompensated ascites. Relative contraindications are extraperitoneal metastasis, ECOG performance status more than three, it's not two. Simultaneous anastomosis might lead to increase in anastomotic dissent, so it is not used. So what are the indications? To conclude, what are the indications where PIPAC can be used? PIPAC is a promising palliative therapy. It can, as of now, possible indications are PIPAC with cisplatin and doxorubicin can be used 
in more than third line situation in ovarian cancer, which could be platinum sensitive or platinum resistant. More than second line situation in gastric cancer. More than second line situation in HPV cancers. Also, five pack with auxiliary platin can be used in peritoneal metastasis of advanced in colorectal cancers and other peritones such as malignancies. Five pack can also be used when there is deterioration of quality of life on chemotherapy, or you need ascites control in platinum resistant situation. Also, intolerance to or side effects to systemic chemotherapy. So, if you look at the ideal framework of a surgical innovation, this is the idea where initially there is an idea, then we have development, then we explore about the surgical uh, innovation, then we assess, and then we come into a long term studies. So, this is how TA TME developed as an ideal framework for surgical innovation. If we see PIPAC, PIPAC right now is in the level of assessment and long term studies. So, in few more, one or two more years, we will have our documented studies which will establish. So PIPAC has gone through an ideal framework for a surgical innovation, which will be more evidence and scientific based. I'll just share a small video of PIPAC. I'll, I'll play the video at the end. So now we will uh, talk about HIVAC. HIVAC is hypothermic intravesical chemotherapy. So majority of the bladder cancer, what we see is usually non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, for which a standard treatment includes transurethral resection of bladder tumor, followed by installation of BCG or mitomycin. The normal course- uh, of Sorry to interrupt Dr. Rohit, uh, you may open the presentation. Uh, presentation is not open, sir. No. Is it seen now, sir? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, uh HIVAC is hypothermic intravesical chemotherapy. And it is usually done. Uh, so normal presentation of bladder cancer is usually non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. The normal course of non-muscle non invasive bladder cancer is uh, there is rate of recurrence and progression which is reaching up to 80% and 40% at five years, which is the hallmark of no high risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So at that point of time, eventually they'll either progress or they will recur. So at that point of time, they'll have a no option either to undergo radical cystectomy or to undergo chemo radiotherapy. However, alternative treatment regimens to prevent the recurrence of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and minimize its chance to progress MIBC are currently going on. One of them is radio frequency induced thermo chemotherapeutic effect, which is a microwave bladder heating technique which has shown equivalent efficacy to BCG in a randomized trial for patient with intermediate and high risk tumors. So HIVAC is mainly done for intermediate and high risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, where either there is refractory to BCG or there is progression on BCG. So there are at least five proposed mechanisms for the activation of the immune response by hyperthermia. So Hyperthermia causes tumor cell increased surface expression of several markers, which is MHC class 1 when exposed to heat. Heat causes the tumor cells to release heat shock proteins, which in turn activates the host immune response. Heated tumor cells release exosomes that carry tumor antigens to the immune system. Heat alone is also directly activates the immune system. Heat renders the tumor vasculature permeable, which allows for better trafficking of immune cells. So this is the setup of HIVAC where you have a common channel. In this channel, you have an inlet and an outlet. Then you have a, a, a heating uh, in, uh, in, instrument and a circulator. Within the uh, probe, you can see there is an inflow which is active. The outflow is always passive. 
this is circulated into the bladder for a period of at least one hour. So the most common system used is the combat BRS system. This is the thermoregulator with attached uh, probe and the Foley's catheter, and this is the heat exchanger. So normally, chemohypothermia is done four to six weeks after the first resection or after second look resection. It is done six or eight weekly installations. The normal dose used is 40 milligram of mitomycin. The protocol usually followed is 40 milligram of mitomycin in 50 ml of 0.9% sodium chloride solution, which is heated by the HIVAC system for a period of one hour. Usually, every weekly six to eight week, uh, sessions are done. After that, monthly for about six to eight months is done. So this is how the mechanism of action of mitomycin is done. There is uh, heat with mitomycin allows for denaturation of unfolded proteins, which also potentiates the actions of impaired DNA repair mechanisms and other activities. So this was uh, the first randomized clinical trial of recirculating convective HIVEC using mitomycin C, which was compared to BCG in patients with high-risk papillary non-muscular non invasive bladder cancer. This was published recently in World Journal of Urology. So as per this, when you look into recurrence-free survival and progression-free survival, there's absolutely benefit using HIVAC when compared to BCG. So the side effects were minimal when compared. So the present indications for HIVAC is only considered as a treatment alternative for patients after BCG failure who cannot undergo radical cystectomy. However, there is growing body of evidence which demonstrates that HIVAC can reduce tumor recurrence rates compared to standard therapy, as well as it can produce promising long-term bladder preservation rates after BCG failure. Now I'll be moving into CRS HIPAC, that is cytoreductive surgery and HIPAC. So the first uh, HIPAC was done by John Spratt in human, as a human study in 1980s. He defined it as a treatment that allows to expose the abdominal cavity to high drug concentration in hypothermic conditions through a perfusion procedure. This was uh, first done in 1980. Main apostle for this method was Paul Sugarbaker, who is considered father of HIPAC. The acronym HIPAC was coined by the group from the Netherlands Cancer Institute. It became the standard nomenclature for the procedure as a result of expert consensus achieved in during the fourth international workshop on prevention of malignancy. The main principle of CRS HIPAC is treating the macroscopically visible tumor with surgery, removing whatever is seen to the naked eye, that is optimal cytoreduction, that is followed immediately by treating microscopic disease with HIPEC. HIPEC is a chemotherapy bath that is done with the regulated FDA approved instruments. Chemotherapy bath will not be able to penetrate more than one to two millimeter in depth. That is why HIPEC must be performed immediately after surgery and also to prevent peritoneal additions. Maximum site reduction has to be done first, then followed by HIPEC. So why cytoreduction? As per Goldie-Coleman model, we know that as and when the tumor size increases, the probability of having non-chemoresistant clones increases. So with more tumor size, the, uh, the uh, non-chemoresistant clones increases. So the theoretical argument for cytoreductive surgery is that removing large necrotic masses promotes drug delivery to smaller tumors with good blood supply. Removing resistant clones decreases the likelihood of early onset drug resistance. Tiny implants have a higher growth fraction that should be more chemosensitive. Removing cancer in specific locations such as tumor causing bowel obstruction improves patient's nutritional and immunological status. So what is optimal cytoreduction? Optimal cytoreduction is defined as per ESMO clinical guidelines as total macroscopic tumor clearance with no residual visible disease. There should be no residual microscopically uh, visible uh, microscopically visible disease at the end of surgery. So we all know the impact of cyto the uh, macrom cytoreduction in uh, ovary or for that matter any peritoneal cancers. Uh, this is 
with each 10% increase in the proportion of patients undergoing uh, CC0 resection, there is an increase in median OS by at least 2.3 months. This was presented, that is published by Bristow way long back. So what are the surgical approach limits? So the Cochrane collaboration, which compared ultra radical surgeries with minimal surgery that is done for epithelial ovarian cancers. The, the uh, Cochrane review concluded that there is low quality of evidence. However, the evidence suggests that ultra radical surgery may result in better survival. RCT is required. So does aggressive surgery only benefit patients with less advanced ovarian cancer? This is results from an international comparison within the Scottrack trial. Increased progression free survival associated with optimal surgery is limited to patients with less advanced disease. Arguing for case selection rather than aggressive debulking in all patients irrespective of disease extent. So it is very important to understand that it is not about doing very aggressive surgeries. It is about selecting a good patient who will benefit from aggressive surgery and then going and adding on with that with high pec. So role of surgical outcome as prognostic factor in advanced epithelial ovarian cancer. This was a combined exploratory analysis of three prospective randomized phase three trials. That is uh, AGO OVA 3, 5, and 7 with total of 3,000 3, patients. You can see that in figure stage 3, when there is no macroscopically residual tumor, the PFS is around 35 months. Whereas when there is any residual tumor, the PFS drops to 14.4 months. Same with respect to OS also. With no residual tumor, the OS, which is a nearly 81 months with any residual tumor, comes down to 34 months. So the absolute and absolute need in treatment of parietal to achieve a maximal cytoreduction, optimal cytoreduction, what we call. Without that, it is no point in doing a high pack. So for surgical approaches, many peritonectomy procedures were defined by Paul Sugarbaker. Usually they're defined in terms of right upper peritonectomy, left upper peritonectomy, anterolateral subhepatic pelvis, In simple, the concept of local regional therapy as a combined procedure, it includes first peritonectomy with multivisceral resection, then followed by intraperitoneal chemotherapy with hyperthermia. Surgery clears the macroscopic disease, IPEC clears the microscopic disease. So now it is important to understand what is peritoneal cancer index. Many of us would have gone through this picture. But what is important is to go beyond the picture to understand what is it that has been described here. So the two lines, if you use horizontal lines, passes through the sub, uh, the lower part of the costal, car uh, costal cartilage and along the anterior super ilex spine. The, uh, the vertical lines come along the midclavicular line. They are divided into eight quadrants. So the lesion size score is determined after complete lysis of all adhesion and the complete inspection of all parietal and visual peritoneum. It refers to the greatest diameter of tumor implants. What is important is primary tumor or localized recurrences at the primary site. They cannot, that can be removed, are not included in the PCI scoring. So whenever there's a confluence, it is considered as three. This is the most important slide to understand PCI. Many of them know what is PCI by only this picture, but they do not know what is included in what site. This is most important to understand to do a PCI index. So in central quadrant, if you have the greater momentum and transverse colon, and this is subsequently described like this. Understanding this is very much important before scoring. Then comes complete cytoreduction score. That is the whenever there's absolutely no disease, it is called CC0. When the disease present is between less than 0.25 centimeter, it is CC1. Between 0.25 to 2.5 centimeter, it is CC2. Anything more than 2.5 is CC3. Complete cytoreduction is directly related to the survival and outcomes. So combination of heat and chemo drug, what does heat do? It increases the drug uptake in malignant cells. It alters cellular metabolism and cellular drug pharmacokinetics. Increase the drug penetration. There is temperature dependent increase in drug action and inhibition of repair mechanism. There is enhanced activity and penetration of drugs. 
the synergism between various cytotoxic drugs and hypothermia starts at a temperature of 39 degrees Celsius and it increases at higher temperature. However, above 43 degrees Celsius, this synergism decreases, which I will show in a subsequent study, which was done recently. Temperature higher than 43 degrees Celsius may also induce bowel perforation due to ischemia uh, changes. So this is the principle of local therapy. Sorry. So what is the role of heat? So heat itself is autotoxic to the tumor cells. It improves chemotherapy penetration. Why? Because hypothermia improves the tissue perfusion and oxygenation. It augments the cytotoxic effect of some drugs. So mechanism of cytotoxic potentiation of chemotherapy is by heat. Heat will be additive or super additive in few drugs. That is with linear increase of cytotoxicity with as when temperature increases between 37 to 43. This is with alkylating agents and platinum compounds. Threshold effect which is seen with doxorubicin. That is increase of cytotoxicity obtained after overcoming a cutoff temperature. That is at least 42 degrees Celsius. Independent of heat, the effect is seen with 5-FU and other antimetabolites. So hypothermia and heat shock proteins. This was a paper which I would ask everybody to read. So they concluded with this that therapeutic approaches like HIPEC to achieve anti-proliferative and apoptosis Inducing cellular effects in patients with peritoneal carcinomatosis are negatively influenced by highly conserved heat shock protein mechanism in tumor cells. This study shows for the first time that specific hypothermic conditions are necessary to be established to achieve optimal toxic effect on tumor cells during HIPEC, a finding that opens potentially new therapeutic strategies. So, as per this, this was the trial that was the, this was the trial that was done on the animal model. So you can see here. This is the proliferation of the cell. You can see at, low, at the temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, the, the uh, cell proliferation is maximum. As in when the maximum is reached, that is 41 degrees Celsius, the proliferation is minimum. And then with increase in temperature, the again anti-proliferative effect is decreased. This happens because as in when the temperature increases, there is expression of the heat shock proteins. This will lead to anti-apoptotic and proliferative effects of the tumor cells which come acts as a helping a tumor cell. So a temperature range between 39 to 41, ideally around 41 to 42 is very important to do high pec. So what are the uh, important considerations when we start thinking about high pec? We all have to remember that good high pec is never substitute for a bad CRS. We usually have a trend to overestimate the benefits that we obtain from high pec and underestimate the harms that is caused by high pec. There is huge number of parameters that is involved that we will be discussing and there's variability of lot of techniques. The important de uh, uh, determinants of efficacy are the pharmacokinetic property of the drugs, the modality of perfusion, the perfusate that is used and the duration of HIPEC. As per pharmacodynamics, the tumor nodule size, density, vascularity, interstitial pressure, binding of the drug, temperature, intra-abdominal pressure, all these are important determinants. So what are the chemotherapies used for HIPEC? They should have a specific antiblastic activity for the disease that has been treated, like cisplatin or platinum components for ORN diseases and oxaliplatin for colorectal diseases. They should have a favorable pharmacokinetic profile. That is, they should have high molecular weight. They should be water soluble. They should have increased tissue penetration due to hypothermia. They should have proven increased cytotoxicity with hypothermia. They should be non cell cycle specific. So, specific antiplastic activity with oxal platin, as we have described with colorectal cancer, and taxins for epithelial ovarian cancer, phytomycin C for colorectal cancer. So, they have to be cell cycle non specific because CRS and IPEC is a single shot procedure. So, if they are cell cycle specific, then the efficacy will be less. So, if you see the molecular weight, although Paclitaxel has got the highest molecular weight. It is still not used in HIPEC because it is doesn't have uh, heat pro uh, potentiation by heat synergism. 
That is why paclitaxel is mainly used only for normothermic IP therapy and not for hypothermia where results have not been good. Otherwise, you can see cisplatin, oxaloplatin, all of them have got heat synergism and the depth of penetration is between 1 to 3 millimeter and they are cell cycle non specific. So these characteristics are very important to know before we choose the drug that has to be used for HIPEC. So type of perfusate, the perfusate used should maintain a high IP volume, which will also and also it is reduce the peritoneal clearance of the drug. So what are the perfusates used? Normally isotonic salt or dextrose solutions, hypotonic solutions, hypertonic solutions or isotonic high molecular weight solutions are used. The ideal would be to use a isotonic high molecular weight solutions. Flow rate that has to be important. That is to prevent intestinal damage. The suggested flow rate is usually between 800 to 1000 liters per minute. That is why it is important to use the FDA approved machines and not any heart lung machines to do high pack because flow rate is also very much important whenever the water fluid is circulating in the abdomen. So this is a setup of IPEC, which I'm sure many of them will know. A uh, heat exchanger will be there. We have an inflow and we have an outflow. The inflow is usually placed after cytoreduction. It is placed towards the diaphragm that is under the liver and spleen. That is to prevent the uh, heat injuries because of the high temperature of fluid that will be there at the input. The outlet is usually placed towards the uh, lower abdomen. This is the picture like this. We have a, a suction setup. Then once the targeted temperature is achieved on the HIPEC machines, then the drug is injected. And the drug is circulated for a time left period. So now we uh, come to discuss between closed versus open HIPEC. Closed HIPEC is after the surgery, abdomen is closed, tubes are placed and HIPEC is done. In open HIPEC, the abdomen is not closed and HIPEC is done without clo uh, closing the abdomen. This is a comparison when compared uh, the all the studies right now have shown that there is no absolute difference in uh, the efficacy that is oncological outcomes when compared to closed or open HIPEC. However, there are certain advantages and disadvantages with respect to each, which I've mentioned here. So now comes to discussion about anastomosis, which has to be done after or before HIPEC. Doing, doing anastomosis after HIPEC or before HIPEC, each has got its own advantages and disadvantages. However, the uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, 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 one of the important article that uh, we published in our own uh, trial, when we looked into uh, the numbers where we have done anastomosis after or before, we found that there is no difference in complication rate. So anastomosis of the bowel, it can be performed after or before HIPEC. It will not, IPEC will not affect the complication rates. The important thing is that as and when there's increased the number of anastomosis, there are little higher chances. Very important is to remember to prehabilitate the patient, standardize the procedures, and immediately attend to any serosal tears and inspection the bowel before closure to decrease the bowel complications. So I will start to discuss IPEC in detail with respect to diseases. I'll mainly be discussing about gastric, ovarian, and uh, rectal cancers, colorectal cancers, and also about pseudomyxoma. This is the natural course of gastric cancer and peritoneal metastasis. Left alone on their own, the usual out OS is between 3.1 months to maximum 6.5 months. So I'll discuss only the ran randomized control trial and also the published meta-analysis. This was the first randomized clinical trial that was present uh, that was done by Yang et al. Uh, comparing the outcomes of uh, uh, gastric cancer with peritoneal metastasis with uh, CRS and CRS HIPEC. You can see there is increase in uh, overall survival, cumulative survival, and also uh, increase in PFS when CRS HIPEC was done. Uh, the important thing was that the CC0 rate which was very important uh, predictive factor, which which is also I've mentioned before, and also CRS plus HIPEC. So on multi regression analysis, he found that CRS plus HIPEC and cytoreduction are very important, and also synchronous versus metachronous stage. Synchronous peritoneal metastasis has got better prognosis than metachronous. 
So the next RCT that was done, what was presented last year is the gastric trial. In which. Any locally advanced gastric cancer with peritoneal metastasis with uh, had a new adjuvant chemotherapy with uh, EOX, then followed by surgery, then followed by hyped and then followed by adjuvant. The arms were randomized and are certified according to center, HER2 status and PCI index. Uh, this is the flow chart. Uh, the numbers were actually less. That is one of the limitation of this study. They were not able to reach the uh, adequate numbers that were actually planned. So finally, only uh, per protocol setup, if you see, there were only 15 patients which completed CRS hyped and 15 were completed only CRS. So when we looked into the entire uh, 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 set of patients, non hypac we had 53, hypac we had 52, total of 105 patients. Most of the patients had disease in the corpus, which is comparable. They had uh, even PCA index of more than 13 also were included. This was one of the limitation in the study as well. So if you look into the median duration of uh, uh, CRS, which was a uh, little one or two more in HIPEC group, which is normally seen in all the studies. The median P P uh, PCI was five. Resectability, you can see CC0 was attained nearly in 50% only. Uh, so this is related to grade three, grade four uh, complications. So what is important to see is there was no OS benefit with respect to HIPEC or only cytoreductive group. Even when uh, CC0 rate was seen, uh, when there was maximum cyto reduction, there was no benefit as such. So uh, this study concluded the important limitations were that more than 13 PCA were also included. There was high dropouts because of tumor progression or irresectability and early study termination due to slow accrual. So they concluded that HIPEC with cisplatin and mitomycin for 60 minutes did not have impact on morbidity and mortality. It does not influence OS, does significantly increase the progression free survival. However, it also significantly improved OS after complete CRS. That is, as I mentioned, complete cyto reduction, which is the key in using HIPEC. So this is a meta analysis of randomized control trial. So you can see in all these things, the diamond is sitting towards the HIPEC. One year OS, two year OS, three year OS, and five year OS, all of them showed that in gastric cancer with uh, peritoneal metastasis, CRS HIPEC is beneficial. There was no increased mortality or complication the risk. The meta regression analysis of this study showed that performing CRS plus HIPEC for treatment rather than prophylaxis of peritoneal metastasis is the only variable significantly associated with reduced three year survival. Focusing on HIPEC regimen, regression analysis failed to identify any chemotherapy regimens. So this was another meta analysis study. So when we looked into this also, you can see one year, two year, three year, there was absolute benefit towards CRS HIPEC. So benefit in favor of HIPEC group with median survival of 11 months versus seven months in control group. This result is consistent in RCTs as well as non RCTs as unless separately. A decreased three and five year overall survival and overall recurrence rates in patients without carcinomatosis and an increased median survival of four months in gastric cancer with peritoneal carcinomatosis were in favor of HIPEC group. So this is our Indian experience which we had published, which we had a median PFS of around 17 months and OS of around 12 months. So important to understand this study is that in this, when they looked into PCI and the overall survival, the maximum benefit was seen when the PCI was between 0 to 6. That is why patient selection in gastric cancer is very important and complete cyto reduction. So the cure rate of 11% for patients with gastric carcinomatosis who are deemed terminal emphasis that CRS and HIPEC should be considered in highly selected patients. That is PCI should be less than or equal to 6 and we should be able to achieve a maximum cyto reduction. I am just mentioning about few other important uh, progressions in the intraperitoneal chemotherapy. This is normothermic intraoperative intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Early postoperative intraperitoneal chemotherapy that is EPIC. This is done after surgery 
it can be done with hypec or without hypec as well we also have early post operative intraperitoneal chemotherapy and then the modification of that that is sequential post operative intraperitoneal chemotherapy we have neoadjuvant intraperitoneal and systemic chemotherapy that is nips so this is mainly used in the advanced setup where site reduction is not possible continuous use of nips has shown better results many trials are coming up i will not be discussing about these things in detail now so this is various types of hypec that is done and the indications you can see laparoscopic hypec is coming up in a big way for hypec for palliative setup but they are all only uh, retrospective studies gastrectomy with hypec with the gastric trial so catheter based chemotherapy that is uh, sipc and epic are mainly for palliative treatment and epic is for adjuvant treatment so the ideal candidate in gastric cancer would be a young patient with good performance status pca score of less than 6 with a resectable primary tumor no ascites or parietic lymphadenopathy no liver or extraperitoneal metastasis and somebody was responded to neoadjuvant chemotherapy now we discuss about hypec in ovarian cancer we know that ip therapy has definitely shown benefit in ovarian cancer these are the positive trials and this is the one negative trial because of which there were lot of talks for ip therapy in ovarian cancer this is the meta analysis that was done which showed there is absolute benefit of ip therapy in ovarian cancer so this was the first randomized trial that was uh, done in recurrent setting in a ovarian cancer this was presented by spiliotis it showed that crs plus hypec median os was improved to 26.67 months you can see in the kaplan mayer curve patients with platinum resistant disease also got benefit with respect to hypec so there were lot of limitations with uh, in this study uh, because of which the study was criticized however this is the only rct that is done in a recurrent setting that is published in that we have documented uh, benefit of crs hypec in this group then we have ov hypec this was the phase 3 randomized clinical trial that was published by van reyal group 3 uh, th years back which showed that in a interval setting there is absolute benefit of doing hypec both for pfs and os so this is what uh, we can see so uh, all the groups uh, compared showed that there is better uh, overall survival and progression free survival with respect to crs plus hypec so meta analysis of many studies presented also showed that there is os benefit with respect to hypec pfs benefit with respect to hypec so when when you see the distribution of the studies you can see it is evenly distributed in a funnel plot this is important to know the quality of the meta analysis so this review indicated that hypec based regimens was correlated with better clinical prognosis for patients with primary ovarian cancer for recurrent ovarian cancer hypec has improved os but did not elicit significant value on pfs this was one more uh, meta analysis you can see the distribution of the uh, studies that has been used in this which also showed in one year a uh, study of os and pfs absolute benefit towards using crs plus hypec same is seen in multiple uh, things so this is also on my meta analysis which concluded that hypec is associated with improved os and pfs in both primary and recurrent epithelial ovarian cancer significant increase one two year pfs was reached in recurrent ovarian cancer treated with hypec so can hypec be used against platinum resistance in parp inhibitors in ovarian cancer this is one of the article which concluded telling that hypec remains an important treatment option for advanced epithelial ovarian cancer in the era of parp inhibitors to improve outcomes targeted patients should be those with immunohistochemically proved pathogenic type 1 tumors and those with manifestation of uh, human recombinant deficiency brca carriers so you can see uh, that hypec has shown that it is a thermos uh, it synthesizes uh, the uh, resistant clones that is there so site reduction with hypec in recurrent ovarian cancer improves progression for survival specifically in brca positive patients uh, this was mainly seen uh, this is because hypothermia enhances dna damage that is induced by chemotherapy and also with parp inhibitors this is how hypothermia acts to overcome the uh, resistance that is developed in the tumor cells 
this is by expression of various immunomodulatory effects. So HIPEC is a potentially more attractive way to target microscopic peritoneal tumor deposit. It has direct cytotoxic effect on tumor cells and induces heat shock proteins that serve as receptors for natural killer cells. Importantly, hypothermia also degrades BRCA2 gene, which leads to transient impairment of homologous recombination. This is a possible explanation of synergistic effect of hypothermia and the intraperitoneal administration of cisplatin in targeting microscopic ovarian cancer cell peritoneal surface. So this was a dose finding study that was published recently in Frontiers of Oncology in 2021, which concluded that for gynecological cancers, patients who received HIPEC, the maximum tolerable dose of cisplatin in HIPEC at 43 degrees Celsius was 85 milligram per meter square. Our findings applied to patients who do not receive versazimab is what they have commented. So the usual dose for HIPEC that is used is between 75 to 100 milligram per meter square. So quality wise also, we have seen there is improvement when we compare the cost effectiveness with the availability of bevacizumab and PARP inhibitors. There's been a discussion going on that should share still be done to patients. So you can see the cost comparison with HIPEC, how much and bevacizumab and PARP inhibition. So the field of gynec oncology will most likely evolve to include HIPEC eventually as a routine treatment for ovarian cancers. So many assays are going on. Uh, Hynova, Corine, horse trials, and many trials that is going on. So as of now in ovarian cancer, upfront level three evidence, as of now we don't have, but trials are going on. In interval setting, we have a level three evidence. In consolidation, absolutely there is no. In recurrence, we have one RCT that is Pilates trial. So in interval and recurrent setup, we have level three evidence for ovarian cancer. These are the trials that are going on. Now I'll be discussing in colorectal cancers, specifically with respect to prophylaxis. The important trials that were published recently were Profiler Chip and Colopec. In Profiler Chip, it was done to evaluate the benefit of second look surgery plus HIPEC in patients at high risk of developing colorectal metastasis. So any patient with a low PCI, a perforation a tumor or a oral metastasis, after surgery and chemo, a second look surge uh, was done with HIPEC. What this uh, word peritoneal metastasis, HIPEC was done in them. The main endpoint were disease free survival, second endpoints were overall survival. In profiler chip, the second look laparotomy with HIPEC, there were 71 patients and for, uh, 16 patients in the other group. The three year DFS was 44%, three year OS was 79%. The study concluded telling that proactive strategy, including a systematic second look surgery plus HIPEC failed to improve survival in comparison to an adequate surveillance. So the HIPEC was done with oxaliplatin. Second prophylactic trial was the Colopec trial in which uh, high risk patients that is perforated or T4 lesions for them HIPEC was done. In that also the progression free survival was not so different to have a statistical significance. So it concluded that adjuvant HIPEC does not result in better 18 months uh, survival. So both profilo chip and Colopec were the two RCTs that were presented, which did not show any benefit of colorectal cancers in a prophylactic setting as of now. Now in adjuvant setting, we know the very big trial that was presented recently that was Prodigy 7. This is the uh, uh, schema of the, uh, uh, the trial, which showed using a uh, HIPEC with oxaliplatin 460 milligram per meter square 30 for 30 minutes, no HIPEC. The primary endpoint was overall survival. The secondary was recurrence free survival. This was to inc the increased median overall survival was uh, subjected to many critics. So this was the flow chart. Baseline characteristics uh, you can see many of the patients had PCA more than uh, 11 up to 24 as well. Maximum light reduction was attained in 90%. Uh, the important study results which you have to see is that they didn't find absolutely any uh, benefit with respect to the entire group. When, when looking to entire group, the median overall survival is both same, 41 months in both the groups, and also the recurrence free survival, there was not much difference. However, when there was a, a split to see the PCI index as such, the maximum benefit was seen with patients in the group of 11 to 15. 
there was absolutely a very gross difference in overall survival in patients who had uh, the PCI between 11 to 15, which had a statistical significant value. However, this subgroup analysis was not a planned analysis. So they concluded that addition of oxaloplatin and IPEC on top of CRS IPEC uh, did not influence OS and RFS. There were more late post-operative complications with IPEC. So after this, uh, there were many uh, uh, web-based uh, surveys that were published. So you can see, as per them, the eligibility criteria were in colorectal cancers, it is best useful for PCI less than 15, able to achieve CC0. Relative indications were treatable liver meds and minimal reptopendal lymph nodes. Absolutely no for HIPEC in grade 3 tumors, signet ring cell, BRAF mutations, N2 disease, and PCI more than 16. Impact of Prodigy 7, this was also a web based survey which showed that many of them have shifted from using oxaloplatin to mitomycin as a drug of choice to evaluate the role of HIPEC and also to look towards longer duration of HIPEC. So the important question that comes is, do we still need CRS HIPEC in the era of chemotherapy and immunotherapy? If you see the take home message from this article, it tells that the use of CRS is essential in treatment of peritoneal carcinomatosis in colorectal cancers. Absolutely, cytokine reduction is beneficial even in the era of immunotherapy. So this is an article which I would request everybody to go through and read. They had various risk factors assigned. Uh, due to lack of time, I would not be discussing in detail. Uh, this is also a recent article that was published. So important RCTs that was published in colorectal cancer were WIC wearables in 2003, Profilo chip, Colopec, and then Prodig 7. In gastric cancer, Yang and Cytochip study that was presented, which showed that uh, there is insufficient data for mitomycin testing and oxaloplatin perfusion increased complications. Limited data support the use of CRS plus HIPEC in gastric cancer. So with respect to pseudomyxoma, you can see uh, for this article I would request everybody uh, to go through. So absolute no for cytoreduction in a pseudomyxoma peritonei is when there is extensive small bowel serosa involvement and mesenteric involvement causing retraction. This is various uh, uh, thing. So in general, uh, a good HIPEC is not substitute for a bad CRS. There is general trend to overestimate the benefit of HIPEC. There is general trend to underestimate. There are huge number of parameters involved. Very important is to have a great attention towards patient selection, preparation of patient, teamwork, awareness of technical complexity, and knowledge of morbidity. So in simple, ideal candidate in gastric cancer, Good performance status, PCI less than 6, able to achieve maximum cytoreduction, that is optimal cytoreduction, no ascites, no liver extraparietal metastasis, and who has responded to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. For colorectal cancer, curative resection is absolutely better than palliative care. Patient selection is very important. Patients with N2 disease, RAF mutation, signal ring cell carcinoma, as of now, does not benefit from HIPEC. Imaging, MRI is always better than CECT. PCI of 7 to 15 is the ideal for colorectal cancer. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy is preferred. Mitomycin is better than oxaloplatin. Longer duration is better over smaller duration. As of now, there is no role of second look or prophylactic HIPEC at present. So management of peritoneal carcinomatosis needs surgery, HIPEC, PIPEC, systemic chemotherapy. The important is to know when what should step in. This is only anchored by our vast knowledge by a surgical oncologist and working in together with the team. So to, sum, to simplify, the current role of HIPEC is HIPEC is standard of care in pseudomyxoma peritonei, in mesothelioma, in colorectal carcinomas less than 15 PSI, uh, PCI, in ovarian carcinomas in interval setting, gastric cancer with limited PCI. It is an evaluation phase for prophylactic setting in gastric and other tumors. This is a small slide which compares uh, the PIPEC and HIPEC uh, yeah. uh, when it can be used. These are in simple Such RCTs.
this looking in Canada with the Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm done with the presentation, sir. So, to find the case, we have to use the same limitation for you. Yes, you are audible. I'm done with the presentation, sir. Yeah, no, uh, if you completed the presentation, take the question. Presentation is done? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so open the Q&A and chat box. Uh, high talk you didn't cover. They wanted to know high talk. Uh, uh, so high talk is, uh, high talk is uh, basically, uh, basically hypothermic thoracic uh, same like high talk. It is mainly done for mesothelioma. Uh, See, high, uh, high, high talk is like hypex. It is a hyperthermia in the thoracic cavity. The thing people worry is the And the heart take heart and lung take high more right and cis platin 100 milligram per meter square as a high talk agent so the same hyperthermia machine is used to do the high talk you do a extra pleural pneumonectomy then put all the catheters and seal that area and uh, then you do at least about 60 minutes of high talk so it is usually used for uh, you know mesothelioma of the pleural cavity hyperthermia is also used for hyperthermic limb perfusion the same machine which you use for high peak and high talk can be used like for, uh, you know, multiple cutaneous melanomas in the leg, recurrent melanomas in transit. So then you use a hyperthermia through the femoral artery, femoral vein bypass, put it to this machine. Um, um, so, uh, uh, one question. About various, various cutoffs of, of PCI in gastric, in gastric colon, colon and appendicitis and tumors for high peak and high uh, uh, so, as I mentioned, mentioned uh, uh, in the studies and articles, the ideal, ideal Dr. Rohit, no, sorry to interrupt, there is, there is another application in your room. In your room. Is anyone logging to your mobile or any of the laptop in your room? No, no. Because there is an external sound. sound. That's right. Okay, if, if, uh, if you are logged in through mobile, switch it off, keep it only one. No, mobile, no, mobile is not logged in. Okay, go ahead. There is one more question. What is the pressure and duration of pipac and hypac for ovarian cancer? Yeah. Uh, uh, so I so have I actually uh, 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 done uh, a video, video for that. So, so the drug, the drug that, that is used is cisplatin and doxorubicin. Doxorubicin at the dose, dose of, of right now, right now 3 milligram per meter square and cisplatin at 15 milligram per meter square. The maximum the pressure, pressure that can be borne is up to 3 up to milligram, milligram PSI. PSI. However, 280 PSI, PSI is what is what recommended. recommended. Flow rate, flow rate is, is between 0.5 to 0.7 ml per second. second. The, the solution that is used that is used is for cisplatin. Use 0.9% normal saline. For oxygen, the dose is 120 milligram per meter square, along with 5% dextrose. And for high pack? Yeah, for high pack, in orient cancer, 
the dose described as usually as the first dose would be 100 mg per meter square the article that was presented about dose finding study found that 85 mg per meter square showed a very good result when compared to morbidity and outcomes So for so uh, for uh, 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 cancer, we have uh, multiple dose uh, studies, uh, studies which I have mentioned, mentioned uh, in, the uh, in the presentation. presentation. Uh, now, uh, now all, all of them are moving, moving towards, towards using, using either, either a low dose of mitoplasmin or longer duration or mitomycin. Mitomycin is either used in divided dose regimen or a single dose regimen. Role of prophylactic hypex. He already covered it very well. As of today, colorectal, uh, appendiceal, ovary, there is no role of prophylactic. There are some evidence picking up in gastric cancer. However, they are not level one evidence. So as of today, colon, rectum, prophylactic hypex has not shown benefit. Prophylochip, coloche, all of them. So uh, appendix, ovary, colon, rectum, no. Gastric evidence is building up, but not randomized control trial. So, so there's a question asking, asking about, about the role of personalized, personalized medicine, medicine genomics, genomics, and organoids in new developments in high uh, uh, This is a this very, is a very important, important topic that is coming up in a big way, way. mainly because, because organoids help, help us to have a material, material to do a lot, lot of clinical, clinical trials. trials. But it's pre clinical trials. trials. So, so there is definitely a lot of role. For uh, organites to know the drug concentration, to know the drug concentration flow, flow perfusion that are going to be used, be used because there because are lots of variable, variable parameters, parameters that, is, that need to be standardized, to be standardized for hyper. hyper. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Rohit. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think all good things have to end. Uh, the, uh, thank you very much, Rohit. Very well covered a topic which needs like two, three days. Students will try to follow it up in multiple conferences again. Thanks very much. Heartfelt thanks for a beautiful presentation. A lot of hard work you have done. On behalf of uh, NBE and students, I really thank you. Beautiful presentation. Let me convert them to PDF slides and put it in for all the students for you know further benefit. Thank you and over to you, Navneet Singhji. Yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you very much, 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 much,